Welcome back, honors. Ugh! I don't know why, but I've just been looking forward to doing this flip all day. All right, so to getting into this, uh, the Middle Ages, right? So we're now, like, we kind of just finished up with the plague. We've now officially started our simulation, right? We're starting to spread it a little bit. I hear people say, like, spread into, like, to 15 people already. That's impressive. But really, really quickly, let's talk about this, all right? Number one, if the person has already been infected by someone else, or if the person has already been, what am I looking for here? Uh, by someone else, or if you've already infected them, you don't get them to roll again, because they're going to die regardless, all right? <coughs> so, also, really quickly, when spreading the plague, go through your day normally. Do not run up to someone and be like, hey, I have a plague, guess what you have it now? All right, that's not how you're supposed to do it. Go through your day normally. Normal interactions, different things like that, okay? So, also, do not get them to repeatedly roll the dice, okay? It's one roll per interaction. And that doesn't mean, like, Adam or Chris or any of y'all that would do this. You can't run out the door, run back in, and get them to roll again, all right? That's not how it works. Normal interactions sporadically. This is meant to be a true simulation to see if you're spreading the plague at the numbers and the levels of which we... Uh, um, want to. And I'm really interested to see tomorrow, like after day one, how many people in the freshman class alone are actually going to <laughs> have contracted the plague virus, which is really funny. So <coughs> anyway, going forward, right? So we're now moving from the Middle Ages, plague era, right? Into that of the Renaissance, okay? So speaking of the Middle Ages, just to remember, it's a transitional period after the fall of Rome. The big two key factors of the Middle Ages is that, number one, it established the dominance of the Roman Catholic Church, right? So during the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church is going to become the all-powerful entity in Rome. Uh, they're going to challenge leaders for political authority. They're going to, like, push papal supremacy. And they're going to even own a huge chunk of Italy, right? So also... Don't forget that Western civilization didn't die out completely, okay? The Byzantine held on until the 1400s, kind of cradling and keeping safe the mementos and the past intelligence of the Romans and the Greeks, right? So remember, rebirth, Roman, Greek, right? So speaking of the Middle Ages really, really fast, we're now going to jump into the fact that the Middle Ages also saw was like home to three guys who led up to the success of, don't write that, to, here we go. We got to talk about the three fathers of the Renaissance, right? All middle-aged thinkers, technically by time period, right? But these guys laid the foundation for the Renaissance to really begin because you didn't just go middle ages, bang, Renaissance, right? People had to be in charge of this movement and to really get it started. So our three fathers of the Renaissance, right? The fathers of the Renaissance up there really, really fast. But from the Middle Ages, the three fathers of the Renaissance are going to come out of this period. So going in order of earliest to latest, first and foremost, we've got the late Middle Ages thinker from 1225, St. Thomas Aquinas, right? St. Thomas Aquinas was really, really big in rebirthing Aristotle's work. He brought back a major amount of intelligence. He translated old Roman and Greek texts to be able to interpret and hold on to these ideas. But he also really, really quickly brought about the birth of scholasticism, right? Scholasticism meaning, by the way, he needs to get a new haircut, but scholasticism being the idea of retaining intelligence, seeking it out, and asking questions, right, about the secular world itself. Really cool thing about St. Thomas Aquinas is, write this down, uh, he synthesized intelligent thought of Aristotle with the beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church, right? So he made it less about, well, because the Bible said so, he made it more about seeking out intelligence to try and unify it with the teachings of the church, right? So very, very influential thing. You're a very, very important person from the late Middle Ages, St. Thomas Aquinas. Then we move into about 1341 in the late Middle Ages, right before the plague breaks out. That's right, your man from Italy, Petrarch, right? So Petrarch was one of the founders of the Renaissance as well. He is considered the father of humanism, right? So we will highlight humanism, but we will get into what that means a little bit later, okay? So Petrarch's biggest things was he translated Roman texts and write this down underneath. He also studied Roman artifacts, right? So you've got St. Thomas Aquinas pulling in the stuff of the philosophers from Greece. You've got Petrarch bringing in the Roman facts and merging them together, right? Also, really quickly, Petrarch gave birth, write this down, 
to the idea of the liberal arts, okay? The idea of studying the romantics. Really, really quickly, why is it called the romantics? Roman, the romantics, right? The past, previous, classical ideas of the Romans and studying the Romantics means that you are a connoisseur of the liberal arts, right? The non-Catholic church delineated things. Because if you went to a university back in the day during the Middle Ages, you went to study theology. That's just what you went to study, okay? Petrarch's going to bring in the ideas that we don't just have to study like theology. We can study just about anything we want to, right? Ask those questions. Humanism. Study the secular world, right? And then you've got your third guy, Father of Renaissance, the early 1300s. Ah, actually, that's not true. Uh, let's see really, really quickly. When did the Divine Comedy come out? Um, let's do a little pause for Google search, please. Uh, Divine Comedy. Uh, don't write that early 1300s thing. The Divine Comedy, 14th century epic poem. Um, da, 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 da. All right, so actually it is the early 1300s, so the Petrarch one must be off. So give me a little bit. I'll relook that up. We'll change it tomorrow, all right? But remind me to change that because that doesn't didn't make any sense. I knew one of those two dates was off. So Dante, it's actually 1321 was when he died, but this book was published in 1308. Again, Middle Ages era, but he was an epic poet. He brought back epic literature in vernacular language. He wrote epic literature at the end of the Middle Ages in Italian. He wrote it in a native language so people could actually read it and imbibe it, right? Because everything before this was written by hand of by monks, and it was all written in Latin. So he was one of the first people to bring in vernacular literature. There's another guy you'll learn about your junior year in English class that also had a big hand in this, Geoffrey Chaucer. But uh, I'm not as big a fan of the Canterbury Tales as I am the Divine Comedy. Because the Divine Comedy is a book, or excuse me, it's an epic poem of 333, I believe it's 333 lines per uh, section. And let me double check that and make sure I'm right. So, it's divided into three cantos. Each canto is 33 per section. So it's actually like 1,400 lines. It's a big, thick book. I actually have a copy of it. But his famous work, The Divine Comedy, is all about him meeting up with the Roman poet Virgil and being guided through the three layers of the afterlife, starting with the Inferno, which is his diary of walking through hell, right? And then the Purgatory, which is the mountain of Purgatory. We'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow and how it's just really, really neat. And for extra credit... Look up a level of purgatory or hell. There you go. Look up a level of purgatory or hell according to the Divine Comedy for extra credit. All right. Bring it in tomorrow and then have it written down on a small slip of paper and then we'll talk about it. Kind of like what the level is and what the punishment is. Okay. So the really, really neat thing about this though is he's guided through hell. And then one of the really neat things about his version of it is he actually believed that at the very, very center of like the lowest, lowest circle of hell was actually Satan himself, okay? But I'll let you guys do some of that research and we'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow. But he's being guided through the different layers of the afterlife and it's all written in Italian, in a vernacular language. So he's considered one of the fathers of the Renaissance. <coughs> Excuse me, don't write that down. Um, anyway, here we go. So, big thing about, so we got Middle Ages. There we go. So, really quick. So we have the fathers of the uh, Renaissance. We have some intelligence returning following the Middle Ages. But also, in the late Middle Ages, we had the economy of the late Middle Ages returning as well. And a lot of that was stimulated by two separate sectors, okay? Number one, it was stimulated by the incorporation of guilds, right? This is kind of your manufacturing industrial piece of returning back to the Renaissance. Now, a guild, what it is, it's a small group of craft workers or merchants or traders that organize together to set a price on their product, right? So, for example, it would be like if Ravenhorst, Von Hoot, so, Pat Miller and Sam formed a guild, and they were, I don't know, a cobbler's guild, right? They make the best shoes around. The reason why they did that, though, is because if they're working independently, they're competing with each other over price, right? Sam might have to make the price of his shoes even lower than the quality of which they're worth because he's working alone, right? So by them uniting together, they can actually set the price on their product and make a better product. Also, the really cool thing about their guild, they could recruit other people into it. So they could recruit Joe Gangrich or Raj Crane over from the other side. Like, hey, come learn how to make uh, shoes in our cobbling guild. But what if Joey Martirano and Chris Still and Adam Rennie and, trying to think of, and Shaw Martin already had another guild, and it was a smithing guild, right? A blacksmith guild. And they were like, nah, bro, you need to come over here and learn how to be a blacksmith. So by doing this, these guilds 
re-stimulated the industrial sector of the economy. So people actually began to make products again, charge high prices, and the economy also began to rise. Also, really quickly, write this down, uh, which is very important. The Black Death, according to many revisionist historians, might have actually helped the economy because with less people, you have smaller markets and increased competition, right? So smaller markets means that you have to make a higher quality product and you have to compete more with other people to try and make a better product. So there's a chance that the killing off of the population boom from the great warming period during the Middle Ages actually may have helped the economy reflourish after the late Middle Ages leading into the Renaissance. So that's your industrial sector, the craft guilds, right? So there you have, I believe it's carding guilds to make barrels, right? And then you got a cobbler's guild. So then the beginning of the Renaissance also had an agricultural component, right? The beginning of the Renaissance also saw its agricultural component in that of farmers, right? They began to specialize their crops. Now I used the guys in the last example because they're guild workers. You weren't allowed to join a guild if you were a woman. Sorry, ladies. Um, so, but we can use the ladies for our agricultural sector, right? So let's say I think you got Faith Hardy and Susie and Kayla and Madison Marks, and they all work on a lord, on a thief for a lord, right? And I'm the lord, and they work for me, and I'm like, all right, y'all need to farm all different types of crops. You give me X number of them. I eat off that. You farm just enough to feed your families. Deal? And they're like, okay, well, he's giving us somewhere to live. I guess we'll take that. But the problem is, is you're not advancing anything. But let's say our feudal contract runs out, right? And you guys are like, screw this. I'm going to leave, and I'm going to start my own farm, and I'm going to make my own money. I'm going to do my thing, right? So they decide to leave, and they decide to start like selling crops on their own. Susie and Faith and Madison and Kayla realize, wait a minute, if we're all growing a bunch of different types of crops, then we're going to end up competing with each other and we're not focusing on specializing, right? So Susie's like, I don't know about y'all, but I grow the best Brussels sprouts anybody's ever tasted in their life, so I'm just going to grow Brussels sprouts and make more money that way. And then you got Faith, she's like, yeah, I grow the best turnips that anybody's ever had in their life, right? So she's going to decide to grow just those to help stimulate the economy, specializing their crops, right? So et cetera, et cetera. Madison grows carrots, and then Kayla's going to grow, I don't know, lettuce. Bleh. All those things are not good, except Brussels sprouts are delicious. So I take that back. And carrots are good, too. So anyway, but also, last thing, city-states are going to become a specialized according to their location. And when we're talking about these city-states, we're talking particularly about the Italian city-states, right? So this is going to be the last thing we talk about today. Let's go ahead and jump over here real quick. What I need you to do is follow along with me a little bit. And what you're going to need to do is draw this map of Italy, of which I'm about to draw as well. So let me grab a couple of books to sit you guys on top of so you can actually see this bad boy. All right, here we go. So there we are. Now, so draw Italy along with me really fast, all right? So we're going to see if I can do this well. So if I'm going to, all right, there we go. <coughs> yeah, northern Italy up here, and then it comes in, and then it's like, nah, 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 and then it goes that, that, blah, 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 and then there's the toe of the boot, and then blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's a really, like, sketchy lines. And then so we've got Sicily down here. There we go. So we've got the Italian peninsula. Now, really, really quickly, next to this map that you just drew in your notes, first of all, not unified, all right? So Italy is technically a younger country than that of the United States of America. So Italy was not unified. It was broken up into a bunch of smaller city-states and a bunch of smaller provincial areas, right? So there were three, count them, three extremely strong city-states by this point in history, though. You've got over here on this side, Milan, right? And then you've got over here, Venice. And then right here, you got Florence, right? So in your notes, you've got Milan, right? Now Milan's big thing that they were making money off is processed goods, textiles, and mercenary work. All right, so in mercenaries. So anyway, what I mean by that is like hired militias, hired militaries. The Sforza family actually led Milan, and they were actually a huge mercenary family. They actually led the entire country through like this coalition of military leaders. It's actually really cool. And then over here, we've got Florence, right? So Florence made their money as a center for two things, right? So they had alum, which was actually a really, really cool thing. It's a chemical for dyeing fabrics, okay? So fabrics. And then also they were the center of European banking. All right. So they had a major banking enterprise that actually erupted from there. And then the last one we've got over here is Venice. Right. So Venice is actually really cool because it was the only one out of all of them that managed to stay a de facto republic. Right. 
But they make all of their money off trade with Byzantine. And I'm going to put slash Ottoman Empire. Okay? They had a bunch of trade embargoes that made it so the Ottoman Empire over here in this general area, we're going to say like this is modern day Turkey or whatever. Let's say that's Istanbul or slash Constantinople slash Ankara, whatever. They actually were on the Mediterranean trade route and they would just trade back and forth with them all the time. That's how Venice made most of their money, right? So now tomorrow we're going to talk about what the Renaissance is all about, secularism, humanism, the ideas behind it. We're going to get more into the why Italy is the home of the Renaissance and kind of use Florence as a really, really good example. Talk about the Medici family and the rise of family firms and things like that. But yeah, so very, very nice job, guys. That's kind of Italy. Remember, it's not unified. It didn't become unified until the mid-1800s, late-1800s. Um, we actually are almost 100 years older than the country of Italy. So it's actually crazy. Now, anyway, but yeah, so we got Venice, Milan, Florence. That's how they made their money. Sorry. Money. Alum was actually a really, really cool subject. It actually died most of this blue. Um, anyway, so, but yeah, there you go. But this is us signing off for the day. Uh, good job today, by the way. Get out there, spread that plague. Remember, go through your day normally, okay? So, I will see you guys later. Have a good evening, Cam. Or, excuse me. Have a good evening, honors.